Thanks to everyone who supports Go With The Heat podcast directly. If you'd like to find out more or become one of our supporters, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 6, titled Line of Fire. Okay, hi everyone. It's our first episode now that Amnesia is officially done. Let's bring on the new kid and the new show. Miami Vice is dead now. (laughs) (laughs) Let's move on. It originally premiered on December 16th, 1988. It is written by Raymond Hartung, who's got one more episode coming, but he was the story editor for essentially every episode in season five. Editor. Editor. (laughs) (laughs) It is directed by Richard Compton. Man, that name sounds really familiar. Oh, yeah. Down for the Count, part one and two. Everyone is in showbiz. The Big Thaw. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he also did Mirror Image. Interesting. Hmm. So he's kind of all over the map. Yep. <laughs> Hit or miss on he this. He killed Zito. We always remember that. <laughs> to, to be fair, as the producer, most of your job is just selling commercial time. <laughs> How much soap do you think they could sell during Miami Vice? <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, could check in who was in each other's lives. Pals, there's going to be some schedule changes coming up. And I know we talked about at the beginning of the season, and you're like, oh, man, what do you mean more schedule changes? Well, this one's actually for a little bit of a different reason. Melissa and I are expecting our fourth baby. When this episode comes out is roughly about the time when the babies do. So that's also why you've been hearing more pre-recorded episodes from us. As we've been feverishly preparing for our life with a fourth child. (laughs) Yeah, preparing. (laughs) Lots of preparations. (laughs) So the schedule change that we're going to have is, as I mentioned, more pre-recorded episodes when we find time. Also, for the next, say, four or five episodes, we're going to switch to a bi-weekly schedule. So we'll make sure we're plenty up front about when that's going to end. We're not going to go bi-weekly forever. It's just going to be while we have a newborn in the house and plenty of hands around and make sure the newborn is being taken care of along with our toddler. <laughs> the nervous laugh from Melissa. Oh, yeah. just be up. You guys are just going to be, you guys are just being lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Four kids. God, that's nothing. I've got two dogs and I'm thinking about getting a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited. We're very happy. We didn't think ahead of time of when it would fit in with our podcast schedule and that would <laughs> yeah, almost <I> know. <laughs> be the end of season of the whole show run. In fact, that didn't, that didn't come, didn't come into factor at all. No, it's just, interesting. It's I don't know so, about that. <laughs> question, guys. Does that mean that if we end the show when the ba- at the same time that the ba- uh, you have the baby, Melissa, does that mean we have to name the baby Crockett? <laughs> Well, the baby's a girl, so... Gina Trudy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gina I'm not Trudy. naming my girl Crockett. Sorry. <laughs> All right, John. Let's take a look at this week's music. We have a episode about metal. So hopefully, fingers crossed, there's some big name metal band that will make an appearance. Like something that also includes like Harleys and big stage performances and stuff. What do you got for us this week? That's exactly what we have. Uh, you're <laughs> describing ministry, right? <laughs> we have the song Stigmata by Ministry, and they are a U.S. industrial metal band fam- founded in 1981. Probably the biggest band in the episode, you know, minus, you know. You know. Two out of the other three. But <laughs> Jurgensen, his girlfriend, actually was the one that introduced him into the music scene in Chicago at the time. First band was called Special Effect. Follow that up with a short-lived band called the Carmichaels. He would meet the co-owners, the record label, Wax Tracks. He would record a demo with them, and they would and they would offer him a single as well as help, uh, basically help him form the band Ministry. At first, Jorgensen wasn't going to sing. He was just going to play guitar. They held auditions. They auditioned like 12 singers. And basically, they all sucked. <laughs> so basically, that led to uh, Jorgensen singing. They released the single Cold Life with Wax Tracks, which would turn out to be their first hit as a record label. They would get a contract. 
from the single they did with Wax Tracks, but it would turn out to be a letdown. They would release the album with sympathy because of the low sales. They would go back to Wax Tracks. They would release Twitch, which marked the end of more of their pop electronica phase and led to their core, what made them popular, with their releases of The Land of Rape and Honey in 1988, and that would be the beginning of them bringing on the metal. They released this song, Stigmata, which would also be used in the uh, 1990 film Hardware. They'd follow that up with a 92 as as one of the headlining acts of Lollapalooza, and then they would release Filthy Pig, uh, fairly successful, and then they would follow that up with Dark Side of the Spoon, which (laughs) I am finding that I am really liking their album name so far. <laughs> like, like, like Dark Side of the Spoon is actually the, dedicated to a former band member, William Tucker, who committed suicide earlier that year. They re- also released the song ba- Bad Blood on the Matrix soundtrack, as well as the song What About Up, which actually performed in a cameo role in Spielberg's AI. So around this time, 2001, Jorgensen actually almost lost his arm to a spider bite and he actually did lose a toe stepping on a discarded hypodermic needle Damn. he was also severely depressed this would lead to him getting clean with help of his agent angelina uh, lucasen uh, who would later become his wife final album the last sucker in 2007 they would follow that up with a reunion tour, he would relapse. Guitarist Mike Seca would die on stage from a heart attack. Holy shit. Wow. with his side band, Rigor Mortis, <laughs> in 2012. They would release their last, last album, From Beer to Eternity, in 2013. Jurgensen would come out and say that the band can't go on anymore without Mikey. And then in February 2017, they began work on their 14th album, <laughs> which they promised to be their last, last, last album. <laughs> They're one of those metal bands that kind of fly under the radar. Unlike our next band in music, Iron Maiden, with the song Only the Good Die Young. Iron Maiden, I mean, it's freaking Iron Maiden. They yeah. are massive. Believe it or not, they were formed in 1969. Uh, I'm sorry, 1970. They were formed in 1975 on Christmas Day. <laughs> they were formed by bassist Steve Harris shortly after leaving his previous band smiler <laughs> the name always the back the previous <laughs> bands are always the best yes we're actually named after the iron maiden torture device which is like the coffin thing with the spikes in it so they were pioneers of the new wave of british heavy metal it blew up during the 80s with albums the number of the beast Peace of Mind, and Power Slave. Uh, They're one of the most successful heavy metal bands in history. They've sold over 100 million records as of 2017, and they've performed over 2,000 live shows as of 2013 with 16 studio albums. So for 35 years, they've been rolling, and for 35 years, they have been supported by a zombie-like mascot named Eddie. Hmm. Uh, Eddie first appeared as part of their album art and continued in every single one of their albums. Eddie is on the album. Also, they also dress someone like Eddie for shows, and Eddie likes to change his appearance. So sometimes he's a zombie, sometimes he's like a evil doctor. So, but it's always the same Eddie mascot. First show was uh, May 1976, before they took up residency at the Cart and Horses Pub in Stratford. Just sitting that Iron Maiden was a pub band. Part of the reason it took them a little bit of having to play in a pub was because numerous changes uh, in the band's early lineup would lead to Harry and Dave Murray remaining as the uh, band's longest standing members, but everyone else kind of wrote through different times. And everything started out with their 1978 demo. It was a four-song demo that got a little play at a local club. The club owner happened to like it, and he played it so much, then they released a three-song demo, and like, hey guys, we can sell this shit. So they started (laughs) selling it, they sold out. Sold out the complete demo, and this caught the attention of record company EMI, signed them, and then 
By 1980, they released their self-titled debut album, which would peak number four on UK charts. They'd open for bands like Kiss and Judas Priest and do some European tours. One, they would release their second album, Killers. At this time, they'd replace their drummer. In 82, they would release The Number of the Beast, which would be their first number one on UK charts. And top ten in... Uh, whole bunch of other countries so and that would include songs like children of the damned and run to the hills uh, uh run to the hills, to the hills. <laughs> and that actually uh stirred up some stuff a uh, christian activist actually called them satanists started destroying their records which i'm sure <laughs> only made them sell better by the way people buying their record to destroy it only supports the band. <laughs> the more you know. They would go through more drummers and more drummers, uh, about as many drummers as Spinal Tap. Uh, <laughs> that would lead to Welcome to the Big Time, the World Slavery Tour. Once again, fantastic naming. <laughs> the World of Slavery Tour was 193 shows in 28 countries over 13 months to an estimated 3.5 million people. Damn. From 86 to 90, that just continued success. You'd also start to get some 90s solo projects in between stuff from other band members. And that lead to Bruce Dixon, who was in 93, who was the vocalist at the time, the singer. He would leave the band to pursue a solo career. They would audition and go through thousands of tapes before convincing Blaze Bailey, formerly of Wolfane, to join the band. They would record an album to mixed reception. The album X Factor would basically chart their lowest possession position since 1981. They would continue on with Bailey, who would eventually ask to leave the band himself. He basically kicked himself out of the band due to poor performance. No one likes uh, at me, a guys. band meeting, like literally. <laughs> yeah, I'm I should just go. Which, yeah. which would lead them to inviting. Bruce Dixon back, uh, because apparently things solo-wise weren't going well, and he would only come back as long as they brought back Adrian Smith too. They would have a resurgence in, of popularity in the 2000s that would lead to tours, festivals, and they are even planning a new tour in 2018 through 2019. I'm in for it, and here's what I'm going to say. Right now, you can go on, you can go see a tour where it has artists like Sir Mix-a-Lot, Vanilla Ice, and some other 90s hip-hop band they're like all touring together there's a bunch of those those types of tours i am totally down for one of those like old man tours but for metal so give me iron maiden slayer sepatora doing a tour together or even maybe suicidal tendencies in on that i'm in no, no ministry <laughs> Sorry, guys. No comment Sorry. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we've talked about ministry. Now we've talked about Iron Maiden. You can't possibly get bigger than that, can you? I mean, can you? <laughs> well, you can, guys, because we have Madam X by Rugged Edge. <laughs> Rugged Edge, obviously, Florida's most famous local band from the late 80s early 90s that specifically did shows at miami's cameo theater and had big mohawks and played uk punk style from 1985 to 99 now i know that's pretty specific they are the best of that i mean it's pretty specific <laughs> <laughs> they did have one full-length album at least one in 1989 called eclipse of fire be somewhat serious for a minute Rugged Edge was actually a really popular local band in Florida. It was kind of cool that Vice actually got them onto the show because that was right about the time when they were opening for some like seriously big band, including bands like Mystery and, and Iron Maiden and such when they came mm. through. This was the go-to band to open for these guys. Like everyone thought like that was they were just gonna break out of this scene. Except, well, Florida's not really known for having much of a punk scene. I don't think I can name very many punk bands to come out of Florida. I can name about the L.A. punk scene. I can name about 10 or 20 bands that came out of there. But unfortunately for Rugged Edge, not too many Miami 
Florida punk there. I, I, I don't know. They might still be around, too, by the way. <laughs> I think I saw a Facebook. So the Facebook doesn't have much information, but you can direct message them. And I'm sure if you offered them money, they would play your quinceanera or your birthday. I'm giving you a shout out, Roganesh. Don't let me down. I'm serious. They actually do have a Facebook page if you if you look them up. I don't know if they check it, but I really hope so. If you get them to play your birthday party, please send us footage of Rugged Edge playing. And we will include it on the website. Listen, Rugged Edge, here's what we're saying. We might be scheduling a trip to Miami for the end of our show about Miami Vice. We would love to set up, set you up at a park and then have you play <laughs> Madam Max we also, while we're there. We, we also, we've never had a theme song for the show. So <laughs> I'm just saying, guys. We... <laughs> there you go. We could pay you okay, all right. five dollars. Five whole dollars. <laughs> I guess we got to wrap this thing up. So the last band, not very big. These guys called Derek and the Dominoes. Yeah. Who, um, like, it's got some guy like it, 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 Aaron, Aaron Slapson. What's <laughs> his name? <laughs> I don't know. The song's called Layla. I, I think you can get it on iTunes. Uh, no, okay. So let me get all serious here. I am not going to go into my love affair for Eric Clapton. So, <laughs> it's embarrassing, um, quite frankly. <laughs> and we could go on forever about good old slow hand. Let's just talk about Derek and the Dominoes. Because Derek and the Dominoes was only about a two-year period. So Derek and the Dominoes were a blues rock band formed in the spring of 1970 by Eric Clapton, but it was formed by him and keyboardist and singer Bobby Whitlock and also included bassist Carl Gretel and drummer Jimmy Gordon. But all four of them had previously played together in Clapton's last band called Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. The only difference was that Delaney and Bonnie weren't in this new band because Delaney and Bonnie were a couple and they bickered a lot and um, the guys got kind of tired of hanging out with them. So they kicked them out of the band and they <laughs> called themselves Derek and the Dominoes. <laughs> they actually weren't going to be called Derek and the Dominoes at first. Thought about calling themselves Eric Clapton and Friends, or at least Eric Clapton thought about calling himself <laughs> Eric Clapton and Friends. That was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they showed up at the first show and a dispute broke out backstage which led to them quickly changing their name to Derek and the Dominoes. Play story, they, they decided on Derek and the Dominoes. No, Clapton decided on Derek and the Dominoes because Clapton loved it. The rest of the band, eh, they didn't really <laughs> like it, but they stuck with Derek and the Dominoes, which I guess is better than Delaney and Bonnie and Friends. <laughs> They also backed him on Clapton's solo album. Clapton's first solo album didn't do very well, which is kind of what led to the creation of Derek and the Dominoes. So Derek and the Dominoes only released one studio album, and that was Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs. They flew down to, to Miami in 1970 and recorded what are called the Layla Sessions. The funny thing about it is that Layla, the song, and the album Layla and the Other Assorted Love Songs, it didn't really gain any traction until 1972 when it would finally become a hit and start getting radio play until that point. It had really been kind of a failure. Clapton and the guys, they fly down to Miami. They're going to record a double album. They're staying at a hotel, and they're having a hell of a time coming up with things to record. Now, Clapton is quoted, quote, We were staying in this hotel on the beach, and whatever drug you wanted, you could get it at the newsstand. Girl would just take your orders. So that is kind of cool that there is a little bit of Miami Vice viceness to this, and <laughs> that, you know, the band would go to an Allman Brothers concert, and that's what would inspire them to record the album. Clapton would meet Dwayne Allman, and the two would become like like instant best friends. Also involved in the album was George Harrison. So why why George Harrison? Uh, so George Harrison and Clapton were friends. This is where things kind of get complicated. The, the song Layla that the album's named after, the main song on the album, that that song's about. George Harrison's wife at the, or girlfriend at the time. I'm sorry, uh, where is it? No, his wife at the time. During this time, Eric Clapton would have an affair with George Harrison's wife. Damn. Uh, that was, she was Layla. He had cheated on his wife, Patty, a bunch. And so she decided she was going to cheat on him. And Clapton and Patty kind of, you know, they hit it off. She would eventually break it off with Harrison, marry 
Eric Clapton, and which later would lead to a divorce between them. She would eventually leave George Harrison and marry Eric Clapton. By the way, Patty Boyd, she's inspired some pretty big songs. Boyd was li- is, was named as the inspiration of George Harrison for his songs, if, if I Need Someone, Something, which is a Beatles song, and For You, which is also a Beatles song, hmm. all about Patty Boyd. Clapton, he also wrote two pretty big songs about Patty, this one, and Wonderful Tonight, one of his other biggest hits. Ultimately, he would say Derek and the Dominoes was a time in which Clapton would <clears throat> Clapton lose some close friends. He would lose Jimi Hendrix, and then a year later, Dwayne Allman would die. And at the same time, he was going through this, doing a, a bunch of drugs, and he had fallen in love with his best friend's wife, and that would eventually divide the band. The band wouldn't survive it. They'd release Ayla. Clapton would eventually go back out on his own. This is where it gets even crazier. Drummer Jim Gordon, who had basically survived that whole time in the band as an undiagnosed schizophrenic, and and years later, he killed his mother with a hammer during a psychotic episode. And he is confined, even to this day, since 1984 to this day, in a mental institution. Damn. Craziness aside, other members, I mean, this would all lead to Clapton taking a three-year hiatus. And during that hiatus, all people, Pete Townsend of the Who, would help him get clean and get him <laughs> back on track. <laughs> This one, I knew this one was stacked, and this is kind of a music episode anyway, because it's got like the heavy metal theme going all the way through it. Oh, super metal, super metal. It, uh, the drummer killed his mom with a hammer. I mean, how, metal, <laughs> how much more metal can get? <laughs> all I'll say in closing is ministry. I, if you're on the tour, I'm not going to be there for you. So I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. It's mostly, I think, if I have to guess, it's mostly going to be final thoughts on uh, Lazen. <laughs> so, or Lazard. Sorry. <laughs> That's going to be also thoughts about him in particular. Let's go give our final thoughts. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Let us know where you stand on this episode. We were extremely hard on Joey. <laughs> and he's not undeserved. <laughs> but let us know how you feel about Joey. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. I mentioned at the top, we're going to have some new schedule for the next month or so, for the next like four episodes. We're going to be on the bi weekly schedule, not forever. Trying to slow down as little as possible, motoring as fast as we can to the end of the show. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe. You can find all the ways to support us, support step number one. Please give us a review on your podcast platform of choice, iTunes preferably, if you listen to us on there. Go ahead and give us the highest ranking, five stars. I didn't say that out loud, <laughs> but but five stars would be great. But do not <laughs> write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, go in there and give us a full detailed list of what a metal episode of Vice should be, including Running for the Hills. Write that right into that review. Make sure you're clear on what they should have done in this episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.